Okay, everybody, welcome to our, our show this afternoon. Uh, I just wanted to say, if you have questions as we go along, feel free to put them into the, into the Q&A, or you can save them till the end um, and ask them at the end too. Either way is, is fine. Um, and whatever we, uh, we, at the end of the show, we'll have a half an hour question and answer session. And anything that we, we don't get to there, we're gonna try to answer over Twitter over the next day or so. And our Twitter handle is at Carlton Science. Okay, so let's get started. Woo! Okay, everybody. Welcome to the 14th Annual Carleton University Chemistry Magic Show. Uh, my name is Jeff Magic Manthorpe. And on my left here, I have Bob Blow It Up Burke. Hi, everybody. Welcome to our show. So, did you like that first demonstration? I did. Ooh. Yeah, I like it too. Mm. I can still feel the heat. OK, so I can show you that up close here. So that is just some streamers that we put up at a birthday party. Now, thank goodness they don't behave like that when you buy them at the store. Because if they did, oh boy, we'd have a lot of fire problems, okay? In fact, when you buy them at the store, they've actually been treated with a chemical so that they won't burn unless there's a flame sitting right against it. As soon as you take the flame away, it stops. So they're actually coated with what we call flame retardants. Now, clearly that's not the case anymore. So you can see that there's no smoke, there's no ash, there's nothing left. And so what we did was we actually treated that uh, paper with some chemicals to put extra nitrogen and extra oxygen in there so that it'll burn faster and cleaner. The nitrogen makes it, gives it more energy when it burns, and the oxygen means it doesn't need oxygen from the air to burn. So now, I want to see that one more time. Okay, here we go. Whew! And if you're, we don't really have anybody here in the room, we have two people here, but uh, the people in the first couple rows will be able to feel the heat wave from that. I can still feel it. Yeah. Getting a suntan in the winter. Yeah. All right. What do we got, Bob? We have, over in these 10 beakers, a reaction that I need your help with, Jeff. And I want you to watch these five beakers in the front here very carefully. Jeff and I are going to pour the back ones into them on the count of three. So you got three hands? Yeah, good for you. Three, two, one, go. Now watch those front five beakers carefully. Don't take your eyes off them. Not even for a second. I, I spilled one, Bob. There's the first one. Now we've set these up with different concentrations. And so a lower concentration reacts more slowly, so it takes longer for the clock reaction to go off. And the last one sometimes won't go unless you turn your back on it. There we are. So that's one way of making a reaction go faster or slower, is to change the concentrations of things. What do you got? Well, that's a pretty good one. I like, I like clock reactions, OK? But with the holidays coming, you know, we decided to do this show now, you know, because this is better than regular school, right? Yeah. So yeah, I figured I'd do a clock reaction, but maybe with some holiday colors. It's not, we don't have a Christmas one. But what's the last holiday we all just had? Well, Halloween. That's so our colors holiday. for Halloween are orange and black. So let's do a clock reaction that changes color twice. Oh, good orange. Orange and black. Awesome. All right, can you top that? Yes, I can. Watch this beaker. So this is quite a complex system of reactions, which turn blue, black for the same reason that those first beakers did. But keep your eye on it, because this reaction isn't finished. It goes clear, but it's going to go blue again. So this is called an oscillating reaction, for obvious reasons. And that'll oscillate maybe 30, 40 times, something like that, over the next 15 minutes. 
Um, it's a bunch of reactions that interact with one another. One tops one, and then the other tops the first one, and so on. So it goes back and forth until finally one of the reagents has, has been used up. There are many variations on oscillating reactions. Um, this is one of the more vibrant ones to go from yellow to blue to clear to yellow to blue. And that'll go on for 20 minutes okay. or so. So we got a couple questions that have come in already. Wow. Um, first question, is my hand OK? Yes, it's fine. OK, oh. the, the flames there are, are just there for a second. And I actually let it go and move my hand away uh, before I, I get burned. OK, so I'm totally fine. I've been doing that for a while. Uh, the other thing that's come in, Bob, is they've asked us to try to speak a little more slowly because we're a little muffled because of our masks. Oh, darn masks. Oh, yeah. Well, hopefully. Can't you wait to get rid of masks? I mean, I just can't wait to get rid of masks. Yeah. Anyway, it's coming. Yeah, my ears will be very happy when we're done. OK, so. Another question that came in was, why does it turn black? And I think you've kind of touched on that. And so I can tell you that. One of the reactions makes something called the triiodide ion, I3, 1 minus. And we also have in there some starch. And this makes a blue complex. So that's what you're seeing when finally the triiodide is liberated by one of the reactions that immediately reacts with the starch and forms this bluish complex. In this reaction, then there's another, in the oscillating reaction, there's another set of chemicals which destroy that blue complex and put it back to the clear or yellowish color. So it's several reactions competing with one another. I like to think of this as the recycling reaction. The re yeah. <laughs> That's very good, a recycling reaction. All right, so the next thing I want to show you pertains to this ring stand here. We'll just keep the oscillating reaction going here. If you have a look at this, you can see three pieces of filter paper. And on each one, there's a bit of a stain, a purplish stain. So this material is called nitrogen triiodide, Ni3. And Ni3 is an extremely reactive, unstable substance. What happens is that if we slightly shock this, and really all we need to do is touch it, as you'll see, it will explode. And it explodes because it decomposes into nitrogen gas and iodine gas. And you'll see the iodine because it's a purplish colored gas. Now all I need to do is touch one of these to make it explode. And that creates a shock wave. And that's going to cause the other two to explode. It's not that loud. It's a bit like a firecracker. So here goes. <laughs> oh, there we go. See the purple gas here before it disappears? That's iodine gas. So that's this right here. And since the nitrogen and the iodine are gases, and the Ni3 was a solid, there's a big increase in volume. And that's what you perceive as an explosion. So one explosion sets off a shock wave, which causes the second one to go. That shock wave causes the third one to go. And they're just plain gonzo. That's nitrogen triiodide. It's lots of fun to put it on the steps in the lecture theater. And people come down. It's going bang, bang, bang under their feet. They don't know what's going on. OK. All right, now, trying to keep an eye on the chat. Uh, so by the way, in case you're wondering, OK, you guys can't see how many participants are on the meeting. It's currently at about 470, OK? Uh, so. There's about 12,000 of you watching this show right now. So that's phenomenal. Thank you. Thanks okay, for being we, here. We, we obviously wouldn't have nearly as much fun doing the show if, if you guys weren't turning in. So we want to say thanks to people from uh, all over the place. Just to name a few, Petawawa, Charbot Lake, Kanata, uh, Font Hill, uh, Stittsville, Gloucester, Blackburn, Hamlet, uh, Pembroke, Orleans, Morrisburg, Carp, and my Goggles are fogging up Frankville. OK, and we'll send some more out later. But now, let's make some slime. All right. OK, so this is one you can do at home or in class. OK, so the ingredients for this type of slime that we're going to make are borax. So it's about 4%, so 4 grams of borax in 100 milliliters of water. You've got to heat it up to boiling to get it all to dissolve. And even then, it might not all dissolve. So don't stress if it's not. OK? And then one of the other things you can use is 
Uh, wood glue, okay, so this is just a, a multi-purpose uh, white glue that I have here. You may need to dilute it with water to, a little bit to get it to work, but it's science. We have to experiment sometimes and try uh, something a few times before it works. So I'm gonna, you know, if we're gonna make some slime, we might as well make it, you know, look like snot. So green food coloring, and now stir it up. And so what's happening here is in the glue, there are a l molecules of a very long uh, chain called collagen, and the borax causes the collagen molecules to be stuck together. And so the mixture gets really thick and gooey, unlike regular glue. Okay, so I can actually pick this up, peel it off my, the popsicle stick Ugh. here. Gross. We got some nice green slime. Okay, so you got anything that messy, Bob? Mm -hmm, no, but how'd you like it if I blew something up? I can hear 12,000 people saying, yeah, blow something up. Well, that's what we're gonna do. So I'm gonna move a few things over here so those don't get blown up too. The oscillating reaction, I'm not sure if it's finished yet. And I'll get Jamie to turn on the overhead camera and we'll have a look at this bottle. See, it says NA on it. That's the chemical symbol for sodium that you find down the left-hand side of the periodic table. Those are quite reactive elements. And I'm gonna show you just how reactive sodium is. So I'll take a chunk of sodium out of the bottle. And it's stored under oil for reasons that are about to become apparent. So I'll take this and you can see it's kind of a gray, dull looking metal, but inside it's a shiny metal, just like a piece of iron or copper or something would be. Let me cut it. It cuts like butter. It's quite soft. There, and you can see inside that shiny metal. So that's sodium that hasn't been exposed to air. Well, it's exposed now, but hasn't been exposed up till now, so it's stayed nice and shiny. Now, this metal is very reactive, even with water. So if you had a fire in your lab and there was sodium exposed, um, and the firemen came in and sprayed water on it, well, this would explode. So this is why the firemen are so uh, interested in knowing what's in our labs. What I'm gonna do is purposely expose it to water. So I'll take a little piece of this, Jeff's backing up, and I'll drop it into this cylinder, which has about 10 centimeters of water. You might see a little spark here and there. There's a bit of a pop. Um, there you go. I don't know. <laughs> I think we're going to find out sometime today. Is that it, maybe? That might be. Let's try that. Yep, that was it. Nope, that's not it. So let's try another piece. It's hissing. It's moving around like a motorboat inside there. There it goes. So this is a piece of metal. You don't, that's what I'm talking about. You don't think of metal as, you better put out that ember there before it burns a hole right through the floor. You don't think of metals as interacting with water like that or bursting into flames, but that's exactly what's happened here. So the sodium reacts with water. The water gets reduced, as we say, and that forms hydrogen gas and the hydrogen gas combines with the oxygen and causes an explosion. The sodium itself goes into solution. Uh, so that's the reaction of sodium metal with water. If you look in the periodic table a little bit lower, there's potassium, K, that's even more reactive. And below that, rubidium and cesium, they're very reactive as well. What you got? Okay, well, I wanna say hi to some more people that are joining us from Russell Metcalf Greeley. Uh, Mild May, Cremor, Nepean, Osgood, Balderson, Cars, Alexandria, Forest, Armprior, Walkerton, Walsh, uh, Selby, and Smith Falls. So that's just another handful. Um, you know, how far are we going across the country with this? Well, how about um, St. Stephen Middle School in New Brunswick? So All a big right. hello to you guys. 
And I think our farthest west oh, there it is. attendees this morning are from the uh, uh, e-learning at the uh, Calgary Board of Education. Wow, good so for you for being here. So we're going from New Brunswick to Calgary to this morning. Awesome. That's pretty amazing. Okay. Now, what am I going to do? Oh, yeah, right. We're going to look at a phenomenon called supersaturation. So in this flask here, I have what appears to be a liquid. Now, in there is sodium acetate. So sodium acetate is actually a salt of sodium ions, so the sodium metal that Bob was just using, and acetate ion, which comes from acetic acid, which is in vinegar. So we put sodium acetate on salt and vinegar chips. The sodium part gives us the salty flavor, and acetate gives us the vinegar flavor without actually having to put liquid vinegar on potato chips, which would make them soggy, and that's not a very nice way to have a potato chip. Now, one of the neat things about this is this compound is it will, uh, if you heat it up, it will all dissolve in a tiny amount of water and then cool down. It doesn't come back out, even though it really kind of should. So what I'm going to do here is just put in a tiny, tiny little piece and watch what happens. So when it's super saturated, there's more in there than should really be able to dissolve. And you can see that now I got just a tiny little bit of water left, but most of it has just come right out. So much so that you really can't even see the water that's there. Okay. And it's also hot. Whew, gives off a lot of heat. Warm up my hands. Ah, nice. Okay. Now, another fun way we can do that. Oh, that one crystallized on me, so eh, forget about that one. OK, over to you, Bob. All right. I draw your attention to this wicked looking apparatus here, a couple of forks mounted on a board, and this jar of Strub's kosher pickles naturally fermented. This is, uh, I don't know, what do you think, Jeff, eight or 10 years old, this jar? Oh, got to be unrefrigerated. We keep using the same pickles. So I wouldn't eat one of these, but I would certainly electrocute one. So what we're going to do is take a pickle and we're going to stab it with these two forks. Two forks are maybe a centimeter apart. Now, how do you make a pickle? You take a cucumber and you soak it in brine, which is salt water and vinegar and maybe some flavorings and so on. But the important thing here is the salt water. I have these forks hooked up to a couple of wires and the wires are connected to this variac and this allows me to put 120 volts across. Wanna grab the light? Yep. So I'm gonna crank up the voltage here and I want you to watch between the two forks. Now, I guarantee you that this does not smell very nice, especially since we've cooked this particular pickle probably seven or eight times. But that yellow color that you see, you've seen that color before. If you think of yellow street lights, those are sodium lights. And they work in an identical manner. They don't have pickles in them. They have a little bit of sodium metal. But the sodium atoms get boosted up in energy by the electrical power. And then when they fall in energy, they emit that energy in the form of this yellow light. So whenever you see yellow light of exactly this color, you know that sodium is present. If you watch the flames in a fireplace, you see that exact color. We're going to see more examples today of elements that give off a specific color. And as I said, we can use that color to show that the element is present. And by how much light comes out, we can tell how much of that element is present. Now this is the electric pickle. This one is, oh, it's finally died. We'll put it back in the jar and it'll be good for next year. Successfully electrocuted. Or this afternoon. That's right. Yeah. Okay. So I want to send a shout out to everybody in uh, virtual schools. So this is, you know, probably more fun than you're used to having. Yay! <laughs> that's, that's what we're hoping for. But also learning. Okay. So um, we want to say good morning to uh, Madame Megan Miller and her class at Longfields Davidson uh, Heights. Hi, Zoe. Um, 
Lots of students joining us from Bayview Glen Independent School in Toronto, uh, and hello to those of us joining us uh, from uh, Markham and Mississauga. Uh, hello to all the students at Cornwall Collegiate. And we've got uh, a group uh, joining us from Darewood School in Selkirk, Manitoba, and we have several classes joining us from Winnipeg, such as those at uh, Colica uh, School. Okay, and now let's have some fun. Okay, let's see how well you can follow the magic. It's just regular water going in there. All right, now, ever wondered how diapers work? That's what we're going to show you here. Okay, so what I did was I put in one of the cups, one of the ingredients, the main ingredient for diapers. Okay, so where is it? That's on the right. On the right? The other right. Yeah, like I said, the other right. Oh, come on. You didn't put anything in there. Uh -huh. So what this is in here is another polymer, so very long molecules. Poly means many, mer means unit. And so this molecule is, that's in here is very, very long, and it's also extremely what we call hydrophilic. It loves water. It loves to soak it up. So what I can do is add in a whole bunch of water here, just like if somebody, you know, uh, a baby pees in their diaper, it soaks it up. And we can show you just how fast that works. And for what it's worth, that's about 300 milliliters of water. That would be a gigantic pee. And in less than 10 seconds, it's basically gelled out almost to a solid. So there we go. So that's what we call a super absorbent polymer. Now, how much of that is in a diaper? Actually, not very much. Because if we fill the diaper with this, it could soak up so much pee that the kid couldn't even walk around because the diaper would be so full and heavy. Okay? So it's a really amazing stuff. Okay. What do you got, Bob? The next thing I'm going to show you is so uh, maybe a little bit more physics than chemistry, but it's certainly related. This device is a Geiger counter. And a Geiger counter works to count radiation from radioactive substances. This is the detector. It has a window. And if radiation passes through here, it creates electrons inside the tube, and they're collected and shown on the meter. So if I turn this on, and I have here a radioactive source. This is a few grams of uranium trioxide. So uranium is a naturally radioactive source, and there's radiation coming out of this that you can't see, but the detector can see. So if I hold this up to the detector, you can hear that clicking. And that clicking, each one of those clicks, is a radioactive particle that's come out of the uranium through the glass vial and into the detector and been detected. So there are many, many, many coming out per second from this. It looks like about, oh, 50 or 60 per second coming out of this small sample. And uranium itself is not a strongly radioactive material. so. It's interesting to see how sensitive the detector is. Now, I want to show you how you can protect yourself from radiation. You've probably had dental x-rays, and the technician goes around behind a wall before he or she pushes the button. That's to protect themselves from radiation, and they also put a, a curtain over you which has lead in it and, and um, absorbs any radiation except that which is going through your teeth, through your head. So there are two ways to protect yourself from radiation. One is simply to move away. So if I move away from the source, 
far less radiation intercepted by that if you pretend this detector is you. If the radiation is, if the source is close, lots of radiation. The other way is to put some mass between you and the source. So remember, this is you here. If I put some mass there, and this is just a bottle of water, the radiation is vastly cut down. Without the interceptor there, radiation gets to you. With some mass in between you and the source, it doesn't. So if you're worried about radiation, either get away from the source or put some mass between you and it. So this is of interest, especially for people who live in areas where uranium mining happens. As long as you're not in the mine and you're not uh, drinking water contaminated uh, by radiation, radioactive substances, you'll be just fine. So that's a Geiger counter. Cool. Okay, so we've talked about uh, some of the people who are, are watching the show. Uh, I said that uh, probably the farthest east we had were uh, some folks out in New Brunswick and then uh, farthest west were out in Calgary. How about the closest people? Um, turns out uh, we have a bunch of classes uh, here, Bob, from Hopewell Public School. Well, uh, we could throw a rock to it. Yeah. We won't do that. No, we won't. But uh, yeah, uh, for those of you that aren't in Ottawa, uh, they're about 10 blocks away, <laughs> if that. Um, so hi to Hopewell School. Um, we also want to say hi uh, to uh, all of our guests that are joining us from uh, Akwesasne Mohawk School. Um, we, we think it's great that, uh, that you're here. Um, we need more indigenous uh, people in science, so uh, please, uh, you know, continue to uh, have an interest. Um, we also want to say hi to Farley Mowat P Public School and Glen Ogilvy Public School uh, here in the Ottawa area. Okay, and now it's time for a bad breath contest, Bob. All right, you usually win this one. I usually do, yeah. Well, here it is. <clears throat> Got to get the right end. I think it's this end. We'll find out soon enough. Don't inhale, right? Right. I made mine blue. How are you doing? Oh, you're going from pink? I'm going from pink to looks like colorless. Oh, yeah. And, hey, wait a minute, wait a second here. Uh-oh. I think mine's broken. Hey, where's my blue color going? It's disappearing on me. Hey, I don't like that. Let's see if I can bring it back. There we go. So there's two things going on here. When we blow into these solutions, we're blowing carbon dioxide, which is acidic, and that acid is what's causing the color change in mine. It's gone from a dark pink to a lighter pink. But in Jeff's, it's something else. In my case, it's actually reacting with the oxygen that I was breathing out, the oxygen that my lungs didn't actually take in to my blood. And in the, the dye that's in there is called methylene blue. It has two forms, one that's blue and that's the one that's oxidized, so it, you know, we can kind of think of it as rusted. Uh, and then in the, the water there, I put some other chemicals that actually do the opposite of oxidation, that's called reduction, and reduce it down to the colorless form. And now all I need to do to oxidize it is add oxygen, so I can even shake it up, and it will keep cycling like that for about half an hour. And this reaction is also reversible. I made it acidic with my breath, the carbon dioxide. Now I'm going to make it basic by putting some ammonia in, and we get the dark pink color back again. So if I, if I were to put acid in this, either from my breath or by adding a concentrated acid, it would go clear. So the reaction goes back and forth because the indicator has two different colors depending on how acidic the solution is. Yeah. And so what's the indicator in there? That indicator is called phenolphthalein. And that happens to be the active ingredient in laxatives. Most X-lax, for instance, is a solid form of phenolphthalein. So that's why Jeff suggested that I not inhale, yeah. or I wouldn't be having a good day. Yeah, yeah. Fortunately, they, they, they actually changed it and don't use that anymore. Oh, is that right? Yeah. 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 Okay. 
So we said this was a, a holiday show. So let's uh, have a bit of a Christmas themed demonstration here. So earlier we had a Halloween demonstration with the colors orange and black. Now I'm going to show you a Christmas demonstration. And if we were to try to come up with three colors for Christmas, I think everybody would say red, green, and maybe silver. So there's silver, there's green, and now I just need a little red. And you'll notice that those don't, didn't really mix. Well, one of the things I love about this demonstration is that I can actually shake it up. And they still don't mix. It takes a second for the top two to separate. But you can see we've got our red layer back on top. And here comes the green layer in the middle. OK, so what's going on here is this is a little bit like cooking. OK, so if you've ever uh, done some cooking or watched somebody cook, say, pasta, uh, where they have some boiling water and they put some oil in, the oil doesn't mix. It sits on top because it's less dense. It's also not what we say soluble in water. So it sits on the top. And on top here, I have um, an oil-like liquid called toluene. And inside the toluene is dissolved a dye called Sudan-3 that's red. On, in the middle layer here is water uh, with a little bit of green food coloring and a green salt as well, uh, nickel chloride. OK? Um, and uh, maybe that nickel came from Sudbury. I don't know if anybody from Sudbury is watching, but if you are, hi. We like your nickel. Um, and on the bottom is good old-fashioned liquid mercury, OK? And mercury is one of the strangest elements on the periodic table because it's one of only two that are liquid. And here I have a great big bottle of it. Not great big, but big. OK, so that's maybe about 500 milliliters. OK, and that weighs probably about six kilograms. So it's really deceptive. OK, I, I even had uh, a couple people yesterday come and pick this up. And I said, you know, be careful uh, you know, because if you, if you don't know what it is and it just looks like some, uh, some metal, uh, you would think it's actually glued to the table uh, because it's so, so heavy. It's like your brain just, you try to pick it up and your brain's just like, that doesn't make any sense because it's so dense. Okay, you got a Christmas demo for us, Bob? I do. We're going to make a Christmas ornament. So this large flask I've heated up and it contains a solution of sugar in the bottom. And the sugar is one of the reagents in this reaction. The other one is a solution containing silver. So the silver is dissolved in the solution, but the sugar will cause something called a reduction. And so the silver gets reduced. It comes out of solution and turns into silver metal. And the sugar gets oxidized. It turns into carbon dioxide and water. We don't care about that. But the interesting thing is the silver coming out of solution. So what happens here is silver gets reduced to silver metal, and the silver metal sticks to the inside of this flask. So we'll swirl this around for a minute or two, and I think you can already see what's happening, that the silver is coming out of solution. And we're making quite a nice Christmas ornament, a rather expensive Christmas ornament, because the flask alone is probably $200. And then there's the silver, and then there's the other reagents in here, and a couple hours of my time. But you can see we get quite a nice silver coating. If Jeff comes around this side, you can see our faces. And you can also see that the lecture theater is empty, except for two important people on the far corner there. And a cameraman. And the cameraman. So that's a silver ornament. Jeff reminded me yesterday that most mirrors are not made with silver anymore. They're made with aluminum. But this is how they used to make silver mirrors. They would reduce silver ions onto the back of a piece of glass. And this is also reversible. If I put some concentrated acid in there, I can strip the silver off and do the demonstration again. OK, can you get the lights for me, Bob? Yep. OK, so the other thing that we might associate a lot with uh, Christmas would be 
candles. Okay, so I've got a nice candle here, and this is a definitely a magic candle. Okay, because, well, check it out. No, don't eat the candle, Jeff. Mm. Delicious. Jeff does these things all the time. Mm. It's a delicious, delicious candle. Ugh. Who eats candles? Well, this is one you can do at home, maybe with some help. Um, if, you're, if you're younger, um, some help from a parent. But uh, this is one case where the magician will give away his trick. So the base of the candle here is a banana. Okay, The top part is a pecan, so a kind of nut. Okay, Technically, it's a half a pecan. Okay, and now nuts contain lots of oil, which is good for us. Okay, if you're allergic to nuts, definitely don't try this at home. Um, but all the oil that's in there, well, like other oils, it will burn. So I'm using a, a torch here, but this will also work with a, a more typical household lighter. Okay, and you just have to hold it until it lights. And there's enough oil in there that it'll burn for a couple of minutes. And then, well, you just blow it out and take a good bite. Make sure to get lots of banana, and hopefully your mouth isn't dry, because otherwise you'll burn your tongue. Okay, but take a good bite with uh, lots of banana, and it's a roasted nut candle. <laughs> Other tips? would be to put the candle on a candlestick that's got lots of wax drippings and you can, if you walk into a darkened room, you can really sell it as a gag uh, for uh, who's over there at home with you. Okay, what do you got, Bob? I think it's time that we blew something up, don't you? Sure. I've got something here that blows up real good. So why don't we do it up, uh, no, not by my Christmas ornament, I'll do it here. So this is a copper cylinder. It's hollow inside. There's a hole at the bottom, maybe two centimeters in diameter. There's a tiny hole at the top, maybe a millimeter or two. And what we're going to do is fill this cylinder with hydrogen gas. And you probably know hydrogen gas from such movies as the Hindenburg and so on. Come forward a little bit, Jeff, so we can see. There we go. So we have a cylinder of hydrogen here, and we're going to turn that on. Fill this up. The hydrogen will displace the air from the cylinder. As soon as we're sure it's coming out the top there, I think it probably is. I'll put my finger over the top because hydrogen is a low density gas. It'll tend to come out the top. And I'll put this here. And while I hang on to this, Jeff's going to light this. All right, so there's a tiny flame at the top here. So the hydrogen is burning off at the top. That draws air in at the bottom. So the mixture of hydrogen and oxygen is changing as we look at this. And it'll get down to a limit where the two of them no longer want to stay mixed. They actually want to react with one another. And that's called the upper explosive limit. This will start to make an interesting noise in a few seconds. Let's see if we can hear it here. Not quite yet. It starts to oscillate. So the hydrogen burns off and oxygen comes in. And the hydrogen burns off and oxygen comes in. So it starts to vibrate. There it is. Well, that's kind of why we call this the hydrogen bomb. Sorry there aren't enough of these to go around. There we go. That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> now, I don't know how loud that was for you at home or watching in your classrooms, but here it's like somebody shooting off a shotgun right beside your ear. That's how loud it is. That's the hydrogen bomb. We like blowing stuff up. And that blowed up real good. Oh, yeah, that's a good one, Bob. Okay. So, how about a couple more shout outs here to some of our friends uh, joining us from Katimavik Elementary and Steve McLean Public School. Um, I think I saw uh, Half Moon Bay as well on the, on the chat there saying hi, thanks. Um, 
Maple Grove Public School in Barrie. We hope you're enjoying the show. Uh, bonjour to our uh, friends at uh, Pierre Elliott Trudeau Elementary in, in Hull, as well as uh, Samuel Genet and Mayor Bleu uh, here in Ottawa. And hope everyone in Richmond is also enjoying the show. All right, now, another one you can do at home, okay? If you have a black light, also known as a UV uh, light, UVA. So this is just the below the wavelength that we can see, okay? So this is just some regular laundry, liquid laundry detergent, okay? And if you've seen commercials for laundry detergent, they always say, you know, get your uh, colors brighter and your whites whiter. Well, one of the ways it does that is it actually contains a chemical that actually interacts with UV light, so it actually fluoresces. So what's happening here is it's absorbing the UV light that we can't see here, and when it releases that UV light, uh, well, when it releases that, that light, it's not releasing it as UV, it's now more uh, blue, okay? So that actually does make your clothes look brighter, okay? So that's one you can try at home uh, if you've got uh, a black light, okay? And you can get a black light at uh, thing, places like a hardware store. So here I've got a couple of UV flashlights that I, I picked up at a local hardware store. Okay, let's see if we can do uh, the same thing. Yeah, you can see it works with those too. Uh, these sorts of UV flashlights are also really fun. Um, you can see, you know, find all kinds of lint and dust in your hiding in your house with the lights off. Um, and lots of different things are actually going to show up as different colors uh, under UV light. So, you know, even some paper shows up as a, as a different color, um, for example. Okay, so that's a fun one to try. Okay, what do you got, Bob? Well, I've got something related. I wrote on this piece of paper um, with some markers. These are just ordinary markers you can buy at Grand and Toy, for instance. But many markers contain inks which are themselves fluorescent. So they look nice even without the fluorescence, but in the fluorescence, things really show up. You can see, as Jeff said, the paper is fluorescing, a little bit of blue, but the inks are also fluorescing, much more visible under black light or UV light than under ordinary visible light. So there are a lot of things that are fluorescent and you're just not aware of it because you're not, uh, you don't usually have a black light with you. But if you have one, you can find all kinds of fluorescent substances. A, this, what I have here, you can see that's fluorescing with the UV light there. This is tonic water, okay? So it contains a molecule called quinine, also pronounced quinine, um, that is actually a treatment or tonic for malaria. Now, there's not a lot of uh, quinine in here, not enough to, to actually treat malaria, um, but that's what's causing it, that's what's making it fluoresce. It also makes uh, tonic water quite bitter. But just to prove to you that this really is tonic water, okay, I'll take the label off here. Yeah, have a little drink. Uh, Jeff, going to get in trouble. How do my teeth look? Uh, kind of greenish, actually. <laughs> All right. All right, so that's fluorescence. Now, you got something related to fluorescence for us? I do. This is called phosphorescence. And many of you will be familiar with this if you have, a, for instance, a TV remote in your house which when you leave it under the light sort of charges up and then when it's dark you can find it because the buttons are still glowing. So it's like fluorescence but phosphorescence lasts longer. It persists as we say. So these papers on the board have been treated with a phosphorescent chemical and I'm going to cause them to phosphoresce using laser pointers. The first one I have is a red laser pointer and you'll notice that when I dance the spot around here, I'm sure all the cats in your houses are going crazy right now, but not much is happening. I can't see any phosphorescence and it's because red light photons are not very energetic. But how about we try a blue laser pointer instead? Blue light photons are much more energetic and they're capable of exciting the molecules to phosphoresce. So you'll see that happen, but note that it also persists. 
So when I do this and take the laser light away, the phosphorescence remains. So this is phosphorescence, light fluorescence, but persists. So let's see if we can spell something important here. It looks like I had too much coffee this morning. But we hope you all come to Carlton U. And I hope I spelled it right. Yeah, I did. You want to try your flashlights on this too? Oh, sure. Why not? Okay. So yeah, these also work. So it doesn't even have to be light that we can see. It just has to be high enough energy, the photons, of light have to be high enough energy to excite it. So it has to be higher energy than green. So blue is higher energy, violet, ultraviolet, higher energy. X-ray, uh, the next one, might be a little too much. OK, now we've, our next demonstration is a related phenomenon where I'm going to need Bob's help here. OK, it's our last clock reaction of the day. OK, and this one is a reaction that involves chemiluminescence. So the chemical reaction that's going to happen here is instead of most reactions that proceed give off energy as heat, this one gives it off as light. Okay, so that's a little bit different. This is how glow sticks work. Okay, so let me just, uh, these, okay, one, two, three. So these will take a second to turn on, so to speak. Okay, and by adjusting the concentrations and amounts of different chemicals in here, they turn on at different rates, okay? But this is exactly how glow sticks work. It's a chemiluminescence reaction that keeps persisting for several hours, okay? The chemical that's in here is one called luminol, which if you've ever seen the TV show CSI, uh, can be used to detect traces of, of blood, uh, among other things. Okay, what do you got for us, Bob? All right, this is one of my favorite reactions. It's quite spectacular. Inside this flower pot, I have sand around the outside. And the inside where it's red, that's a mixture of iron oxide and very finely divided aluminum metal. And those will react with one another. They're reacting right now, but they're doing so very slowly. So we're going to speed it up. And I'm doing that by inserting a party sparkler here. And the party sparkler, when lit, makes very hot white sparks. I'm sure you've seen those. And one of those sparks will ignite the main reaction. And we're going to create liquid iron in a matter of seconds. And this is the power of the chemical bond. There's so much energy in a chemical bond. If you can release it, as you'll see, I can actually melt iron. And this will just take a matter of seconds. So I'm going to put this here. And we'll move a few flammable things out of the way. I can hear it. Oh, here it is. Where's the other torch, Jeff? On the table. Right in front of you. Oh, yeah, that blue thing. Can't see it for looking at it. All right, so remember, the main reaction follows the party sparkler. There's the party sparkler. One of those sparks will drop in. There it goes already. Now watch out the bottom of the top beaker. There, that's liquid iron. In a matter of seconds, we ran a reaction which created iron as a product. And it was actually liquefied. There's something boiling in the sand here. There's so much heat released. That'll take a half an hour to an hour to cool down before I can throw it in the garbage. So this has been used out in the field to weld railway tracks together. They position this over the crack between the two tracks and let the molten iron drop in and weld them together. Amazing, eh? All that from a chemical bond. You don't think of chemistry as having so much energy, but the chemical bond certainly does. Jeff is going to do the last two demos. Okay, so yes, we've reached the point where we're down to our last two demos. Uh, and believe it or not, we're even going to finish on time. Wow. What do you know? You'd almost think I had other people helping me with this because I'm never on time for anything. <laughs> uh, so thank you to our, our camera crew and our, uh, our communications people, uh, all our technical staff who have helped us put this show together. We couldn't do it for, uh, for you guys without them. So a huge thank you to them uh, for their help.
Okay, now this demonstration here, we're gonna actually have some fun with a peanut M&M. Okay, in a peanut M&M, there are about 13 calories on average. I did the math. Okay, but what does that actually look like? It's hard for us to really understand what 13 calories looks like. How much energy is that? So we're gonna give you a visual demonstration of that by using a chemical that I'm heating up here called potassium chlorate. It's an oxidizing agent. It contains lots of oxygen. And we're gonna, by heating it up, we're gonna make it nice and reactive. And it's gonna oxidize or digest this peanut M&M the same way our body would use oxygen to do it over half an hour or an hour or so. Okay, so this is what 13 calories actually looks like. And this is a little smoky, that's why we're doing it in this, uh, what we call a fume hood. So right now it's oxidizing the chocolate, it's about 700 degrees Celsius. And now it's gonna start on the oil and the peanut, and the temperature's gonna shoot up to about 1,000 degrees. Okay, so I want you to remember that the next time you eat an entire bag of M&Ms, okay? That's how much energy we're talking about. Oh, that's hot stuff. All right. And now our last demonstration is actually related to fireworks. So we talked earlier about, uh, Bob was talking about sodium in street lights. My fume hood doesn't like all that smoke because so beeping at me. Okay, um, so sodium gives us that nice yellow color, yellowy orange color. Here I'm going to do something similar, but now what I'm going to do is I'm going to do it more like a firework. It's not going to explode or anything, but what makes a firework do what it does is that it has a lift charge that lifts it up into the sky. There are three parts to it. The lift charge that takes it up into the sky. There's the explosive charge that makes it go pow. And then there is uh, a metal salt in there that gives it the color. And the different metals give different colors. Okay, I have here, I'm gonna save a little bit of that. One. I gotta do one more show this afternoon. <laughs> Okay, um, so what I have here on the right, the first one I'm gonna do is potassium. It's kind of a, a nice purpley color. Okay, and then we're gonna do strontium, which is a nice bright red color. And then the one in the middle, the last one we're gonna do is gonna be really bright and it's gonna be a color that's extremely hard to do with fireworks. It's the hardest color to do. It's gonna be blue. Okay, so here goes potassium. Okay, and this is why we get the fire alarms turned off too. Okay, here goes strontium. Okay, and hold on to your eyeballs here. We'll see if we can get some of the smoke cleared up. Before we do, blue. Oh, great. All right, that's our show folks. Thank you very much for coming. We hope you enjoyed it. We hope you've enjoyed it. We hope uh, if, you, if you have questions, you want to stick around for the Q&A, uh, we're going to do that for the next half hour. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much, everybody. And the questions are pouring in. Yeah. <laughs> I have one here from Wink. How dangerous are these experiments in general? Uh -huh. There were some students that were concerned about your health and well-being today. Oh, well, aren't they nice? Yes, we appreciate the concern. Um, <laughs> we, we do everything that we do. We, we do with an appropriate level of care and, and safety with respect to 
our bodies as, as well as you know the other people in the room here um, so uh, yeah some of them are uh, a little bit dangerous but we also have lots of experience um, you know in my case it's uh, you know I I finished my first university degree uh, in, in 1998 so you know 23 years of experience and mine uh, was uh, 40 something years ago so yeah we do have the experience to do it we have the safety know-how so many of these are things that we would <coughs> ask you not to even try at home that's why we don't give you the recipe if you want to see them again come back for the next show I just want to say thank you to uh, Krista McGinn there. I, I just saw your comments from uh, uh, St. Stephen Middle School in, uh, in New Brunswick. Uh, thanks for coming. We really uh, appreciate it. We were glad to see that, you know, this has that kind of reach uh, and is, is really well received. Mrs. McWilliams asking, do you like burning things? <laughs> oh yeah, that's a simple one. Yes, <laughs> I, th I think we, we do have a touch of uh, pyromania. Um, and, and that's why we uh, part of the reason we love this it's spectacular when you set something on fire you see something you see the color you see the molten iron whatever it is it sets off all kinds of things in my brain which oh, yeah. I never get tired of yeah someone here is wondering um, what the difference is between water and hydrogen peroxide? Oh, that's, oh, uh, that's a good question. Yeah, I we like want you to come here and study chemistry. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Water is a molecule that looks like this. An oxygen atom in the middle and a hydrogen atom on each side. Hydrogen peroxide has two oxygens. So quite a different molecule. And this molecule tends to break in half right here to make an OH here and an OH here, and those are the species that actually uh, cause the reactions to happen. Water itself, not all that interactive. And is that why hydrogen is so explosive and water is not? Um, hydrogen is uh, something, again, hydrogen is a molecule of two hydrogen atoms, and that's explosive because these will combine with oxygen to make water, and that reaction releases a lot of energy. Thank you. Great question. Hannah wants. Go ahead. Uh, how do you make elephant toothpaste? Can some? Can they? Can anyone make elephant toothpaste? <laughs> okay. Yeah. All right. Well, we don't have the stuff here with us, um, but hydrogen peroxide is definitely involved in elephant toothpaste. Um, so. Okay. So actually, I'll draw it out. So you need iodide ion, okay? So we can usually use sodium or potassium iodide. And this is actually what we call a catalyst. So it's not consumed in the reaction, um, but it's involved in the reaction and how, how it works. I won't get into all the details of that, but what it does is it makes a molecule of water plus oxygen gas and then so because this is a gas okay if we have soap here okay and the hydrogen peroxide comes in water so over here we have a gas we have soap and we have water so soap and water plus a gas makes lots of bubbles so that's how elephant toothpaste works. Okay. Um, will the video be available? Yes, it will. Uh, it'll be publicly available on YouTube. Um, does nitrogen turn into smoke from a grade four student? So nitrogen in molecules tends to form uh, a few different things, but mostly nitrogen gas. So it, uh, it doesn't really form smoke, but it forms a nice gas and it helps things 
uh, burn more cleanly if they contain lots of nitrogen. Um, so in fact, a lot of explosives contain lots of nitrogen uh, because if you want to have something uh, explode, you want it to burn, but also produce a lot of gas very quickly. Um, you also saw nitrogen being produced from the nitrogen triiodide, mm -hmm. the thing that went off like a firecracker. Now, you couldn't see the nitrogen, you saw the purple iodine, but the nitrogen was part of the reason that this system expanded very quickly and sounded like a firecracker. Yeah, and if, if nitrogen made smoke, we, we'd be in a lot of trouble because the air around us um, is, is about 80%, almost 80% nitrogen. So if we could see it all the time, uh, we, we'd have a hard time seeing anything because most of what we're, we're looking through right now is, is actually nitrogen. Have you ever got hurt doing these things like exploding things? I, got a, I, I, I lost some hair on my arm once with the flash paper um, when I didn't pull my hand away fast enough, but other than that, not really. So, but that's good to learn because even though we've done these many, many times, we're still very cautious and small things happen, but uh, nothing major, yeah. thankfully. Yeah. Hannah in Mr. Quinn's class would like to know how carbon dioxide is formed. Oh, well, uh, these are good questions. Yeah. Mm. So I'm so, guessing this is like, uh, when we when we burn something or when we eat something and we breathe it out So if we burn something the the fuels that you burn in uh, in that are in gasoline for instance if you burn uh, Gasoline in your car or if you burn wood in your fireplace at home um, Those substances contain hydrocarbons and I'm just going to abbreviate it by HC meaning there's hydrogen and there's carbon and when you combine those with oxygen which is in the air, you make two things. The hydrogen in the hydrocarbon turns into water, and the carbon in the hydrocarbon turns into CO2. And so we put a lot of CO2 up our smokestacks. It comes out the end of our tailpipes, it comes out of our chimneys, any industrial process that burns a hydrocarbon, and this can be oil, gas, coal, wood. Any of these things contain hydrogen and carbon. Any of these things will therefore produce carbon dioxide, and that goes up into the atmosphere, and that's responsible for so-called atmospheric warming, global warming these days, which is a big problem. Hmm. Sunil and Ms. D Ms. Topham's grade four class wants to know how and, and or why is radiation so dangerous? Ah. Uh -huh. Well, I showed you the demonstration of uranium trioxide. So the radiation, as we call it, is actually um, several different things happening. There are small particles which come out of the uranium atoms when they decompose into a thorium atom, for instance. And the thorium atom we don't worry about, but that small particle comes whizzing out, sometimes close to the speed of light. And if it impacts you, especially if you've ingested this, if it's inside your body, that small particle can break chemical bonds specifically the chemical bonds in your DNA, the stuff that makes you who you are, and that can cause what we, what we call a mutation, and the mutation can cause cancer. So this is why we're so concerned about radiation, mostly because it can cause cancer in the long term. And it's because of those very energetic little particles that you can't see, but the Geiger counter can see. And what grade did you start learning about molecules and the periodic table? So what grade do you start learning about all of that stuff? So the, I think the, I first encountered the periodic table probably in grade 9 or 10 science. Um, so am, admittedly, like for, for those of you watching this, if you haven't encountered that yet, that's okay. Um, you know, it's not like you, you're, you're missing something. Um, you know, well, you're missing out on all the fun, but the mm -hmm. fun will come later, don't worry. Uh, yeah, probably the same for you, Bob? Yeah, I think it must have been middle school. Can't remember now, that was 45 years ago. But it must have been somewhere between grades 7 and 9, I would think. Yeah. yeah. And then our interest just grew from there, uh, mostly because we had good teachers. Yeah. Okay. I see a good one here. Why is hydrogen peroxide harmful to cells? Mm. Well, that's, that's a good one. Um, so hydrogen peroxide, like Bob mentioned, um, 
it has a habit of this bond in the middle here breaking because oxygen doesn't really like to be bonded to oxygen, another oxygen atom. And so there are two electrons in the bond, and we represent those electrons with a little dot. And so it breaks apart, and we get two of these species called peroxy radicals. And so these are form a larger group of molecules called reactive oxygen species, which often gets abbreviated ROS. And uh, these will react with lots of all kinds of different things somewhat indiscriminately in, in your cells and damage them. So important things like DNA or certain proteins, uh, you know, the, the proteins, sometimes your body can replace them, but DNA damage can be uh, very uh, concerning, for example, okay? Mm. And here's a question. When the three materials that were burned in the fume hood, so when you burn those uh, materials in the fume hood, do they smell differently? Um, they don't smell much at all, actually, because of what's, what's in them. Um, so it actually burns uh, pretty cleanly. We, we have another um, uh, mixture that we use for that uh, sort of demonstration, but we usually uh, do that one outside because of how smoky it is. Um, mm. And that one contains some, uh, some sugar. So it, it sort of smells like uh, burnt sugar or cotton candy. Uh, after that one, but these ones don't have much of a smell at all. Okay. And here's a good one, interesting. Why is chemistry so important in, to the future of science? Whew. Go. Well, well there goes the rest of our time. Um, <laughs> wow, we could go on about that for, for ages, but you know, whether it's new materials to make computers faster, uh, all kinds of you know, all that technology, um, you know, all the, the chemicals that go into that are extremely important. Um, and often that's what holds back the, uh, the development of, of these technologies is that they, they don't have the molecules that have the, the right properties to improve the technology. Uh, so I can remember, for example, um, you know, so the Apollo 11 mission, the first mission that went to the moon, okay, um, if you've ever seen uh, footage or photos of that, it's a room about the size of this room here, even bigger, and this room seats 140 people, okay, and that room was basically filled with the best computers that they could have in the late 60s, okay. Now, how much power is in that room? probably about 3% of what's on my phone. So it would take about th more than 30 of those rooms to have the same computing power as my phone. Okay, because you know, 55 years ago, they didn't have the molecules that, they could, uh, that we have now. We didn't know what molecules to make and we weren't able to make them in such a way that we could actually make computers that small and that fast. Another example might be COVID vaccines. Some of you may have had a COVID vaccine. I just got my third one the other day. And I looked on the label and talked to the doctor that gave it to me. There are 10 different chemicals in that vaccine. There's the big molecule, which causes your immune response and hopefully protects you from COVID. But there are nine other chemicals in there that all have important functions. And so this is a modern invention, this, this vaccine. If we didn't have chemistry, COVID would be even worse than what it is. Yeah, and as university professors, we do research as well as teaching. So uh, in the past couple of years, I've actually been doing research on developing new antibiotics uh, and new antiviral drugs that we hope will be able to treat uh, infections, uh, the antiviral drugs like uh, COVID and the antibiotics would be useful for treating, um, you know, when somebody gets a bacterial infection uh, after getting a, a viral infection because their immune system is just really worn out 
it's what we call an opportunistic bacterial infection. Um, so, you know, there's still tons of research going on in that area. So chemistry does interact a lot with different fields. It interacts with technology, uh, like com uh, computers. It interacts with medicine, uh, all kinds of things. So, you know, chemistry is not just a science all by itself. You know, we work with people in lots of other fields. Hmm. And Layla in grade four at OCV, she would like to know what what is your favorite experiment that you have ever performed? What's your very favorite experiment? I bet it's blowing things up. Well, wow, that's certainly my favorite. I mean, the thermite <laughs> just, my brain just turns on when I see liquid iron coming out of that thing in a couple of seconds. I think that's fabulous. We have an, I have another experiment that I like using liquid oxygen. So we take the oxygen out of the air and turn it into a liquid. And it turns out that that's magnetic. It will actually stick to a magnet, which isn't something you would have expected from a gas in the atmosphere. Um, if you go online on, on YouTube and look for paramagnetism of liquid oxygen, you'll see several demonstrations of that. So those are my two favorites. Yeah. Um I, I quite enjoy the, the firework type demonstrations that uh, I, I did at the end there. Uh, and another one of my favorites that, again, we generally just do outdoors uh, because it's kind of stinky, uh, is a chemiluminescence reaction called the barking dog, um, where we have a big long glass or pla clear plastic tube, uh, and we, we have a couple of gases in there that are, are flammable, and we just take the, open the end of the tube and, and light it, and it just goes woof as it burns down the tube and it also chemiluminesces so the, the, the combustion actually gives off this bright blue light um, which is just amazing to see. Hmm. Yeah, and that's a good one. Yeah. Someone wants to know how glow sticks work with all those colors that we oh. saw today. How do glow sticks work? So glow sticks um, contain a, uh, a dye that gives the glow stick its particular color, okay? And the, the light is actually produced, um, it usually contains a chemical called um, something like uh, TCPO. So it's, it's actually a derivative of a chemical called oxalic acid um, and hydrogen peroxide. And so the hydrogen peroxide, uh, when, you, when you crack it, it allows the hydrogen peroxide to mix with um, the uh, oxalic acid uh, uh, derivative that's in there. And it actually forms a chemical uh, that looks like this. OK. so. It turns out that the, the angles here, this looks pretty much like a square, so the angles are about 90 degrees, but the atoms that are in the ring want the angles to be more like 120 or 109 degrees, and so we, it's highly strained. So it actually want, really would like to fall apart, and so what it does, you know, I can actually draw some arrows to show the movement of electrons in the bonds. So the bonds rearrange like that, and we get two molecules of carbon dioxide, and some energy is released. And that energy is actually high enough in this case. It's not heat. It's actually uh, visible light, and that light is captured by the dye, and then uh, the dye relaxes, and it gives off the light again as the color of the dye. So that's how uh, glow sticks work, and we get different colors from them. Wow. Who knew? And so someone else here wants to know, what is the what is the worst thing that has ever happened during one of your experiments? Have you ever had anything go awry, severely awry? Well, sometimes um, things are 
a little bit more flammable or a little bit more explosive than we're expecting. But uh, what we try to do is do them behind a protective shield like the fume hood and back up away from them. So, so far we've been pretty fortunate, I would say, but it's mostly because of careful planning. Mm. Yep. And Miriam in grade eight wants to know if you can make water. If you can make water. For sure, we yes. made a whole bunch of today. Sure. <laughs> you know when we made water? We made water when we did the hydrogen bomb because that was hydrogen and oxygen in here and they get together to make water. And it's that reaction which is, releases a lot of energy and causes the explosion. So yeah, we made a little water today. And Not much. Burning the, uh, the, the firework demonstration too in the, in the fume hood. Um, that uh, the chemicals that were in there contained um, some carbon and hydrogen. I'm making water right now. Yeah. I'm burning this hydrocarbon fuel and it's making carbon dioxide and water and a lot of heat. Hmm. So yeah, good question. We make water all the time. Yep. Wow. And I just saw a question here and it was about, yes. So um, students at Ecole Catholique would like to know, this is complicated, um, about a video they saw on TikTok. Okay. And there was a bubble, there was a sink that was filled with bubbles, and then the people in the video picked up the bubbles and then lit the bubbles on fire. What kind of a reaction is that? So you know. the bubbles were probably filled with hydrogen gas. I think it was like this one, eh? But no, but, no, but it was probably hydrogen, hydrogen gas. Right. That was but, in, in the but bubble. But that's how they made the bubble, I mean. Oh, yeah, yeah, it would have been soap and water, but instead of oxygen gas that was bubbling through, it was probably hydrogen gas. Uh, mm -hmm. And then uh, you, can, you can light that. Yeah. Okay. And I think we're coming up to the end, but here's one more. Can you turn oxygen into a liquid? If so, does it rust iron faster or slower? Oh, great question. Ah, tricky. This guy is gonna become a scientist who's ever asking this. <laughs> yes, you can turn oxygen into a liquid. So you pull air through a tube that's immersed in liquid nitrogen and the oxygen condenses into a liquid and it pours out the other end as a beautiful blue liquid, blue like the sky. And then that liquid can be used for all kinds of chemical demonstrations. We didn't do that one here because it creates too many sparks. It's a little bit dangerous indoors. But oxygen in a liquid form is 400 times more dense than oxygen in the air. And so it causes reactions to go 400 times faster. Um, so yes, uh, it, it will cause oxidation for sure um, to occur very quickly. Good question. Okay. That okay. Is a good one. Uh, this is going to be our last one, I think, and it's a sunny day, so it's very appropriate. Here in Ottawa, it's very sunny. What does sunlight do to peroxide? Um, so it does. Uh, where did I put that? So when I said that peroxide tends to break right here and give us two what we call hydroxy radicals, okay, um, that reaction is actually promoted by light. Okay, and so over time what it does is it actually these hydroxy radicals can react um, and rearrange and ultimately, after a couple of steps, you get water plus oxygen gas. And so that's why if you find some old hydrogen peroxide, you might notice bubbles around the edge of the container. Uh, it's actually oxygen that's gas that's formed and the bubbles are just sticking to the side of the container. And that reaction between hydrogen peroxide and light is used by some communities to disinfect their drinking water because it produces those OH species, but also oxygen gas. And those go on to kill the uh, bacteria and viruses that are in the water. So this is a pretty well-known industrial process. That's a good question. Yeah. Um, I see one in the, in the chat here that somebody missed uh, part of the show. Uh, because of a time confusion. Um, yes, we'll be sending out uh, the link uh, to the show on YouTube um, to uh, uh, 
via email to all the teachers. Um, so yeah, you'll be able to, to watch it uh, uh, later once, uh, once that's done. Um, mm -hmm. The other uh, question I saw that came up was a follow-up on the, on the hydrocarbons in water. Um, so, so asking, well, if we can make water, why, is, why do we have a problem with a shortage of fresh water? And why can't mm -hmm. we just make some? Um, it's a really good question. Mm -hmm. um, most of the hydrogen that's involved in making water comes from hydrocarbons. So when we make water, we're also making carbon dioxide. And th so that's a big problem. When we have uh, too much carbon dioxide um, already in the atmosphere, um, making more for the sake of making water just doesn't make sense. And uh, if, if we were to try to use other sources of hydrogen, um, while well, often the source of hydrogen is actually water, so that doesn't really work. You know, you break water to make hydrogen to make water. It's not a very sensible thing to do. Um, but a lot of our other sources of hydrogen are still just hydrocarbons. Um, you know, so it's, yeah, getting hydrogen is, uh, to make water is, is a problem. And we don't really need to make water in most of the world. There's as much water now as there ever was. It's just that it's not all as clean as it used to be. So what we need to do is extract the water from dirty water mm -hmm. and clean up the water in that fashion, and then there will be plenty of water. Well, and I think what the, what the question was also implying was there are certain areas now that are being affected by climate change ah. where they're, they're having droughts yeah. or not as much rainfall. Um, and, and so, you know, traditional sources of, of water like aquifers underground are being, uh, you know, either uh, contaminated by modern activities or they're, they're being consumed. And so they need new sources of water. So, you know, I, I think a great challenge for chemistry in, in, the fu in now and going forward is actually going to be uh, mat making materials that will allow us to do efficient desalinization of salt water so we could take ocean water and, and filter it uh, to get rid of the salt and, and get fresh water. I think that would be a, a very efficient way to get uh, more fresh water in a lot of parts of the world. And probably that technology is going to come from people studying chemistry. So you should study chemistry. It's yeah. that simple. Yeah, I mean, really, I think, you know, we all talk about right now about sustainability in the world, right? And we have all of these things that we, we have in our modern lives, and we, we'd like to not have to give them up as much as possible. So how do we do them in a more sustainable way? Well, we're going to need new and different chemicals and different technologies that enable us to do that, do things and live our lives in a more sustainable way. So how are we going to do that? Well, we need new chemicals. So we need people to study chemistry. You know, people are concerned about pollution, you know, and how do we clean up the pollution that's already out there? Well, the people who are going to develop those solutions are chemists, you know, I mean, admittedly, some of those problems were created by chemists you know, and, and chemical industry. But the reality is they're also the people that are going to clean it up. So we need people to study chemistry to help with all of these challenges that uh, our world is facing. Well put. Very well put. That's a good note to, um, to close out on. We've reached our time at 11 o'clock. So I thank you very much. We're getting a lot of thank yous from the different schools that attended today. And um, yeah, as uh, Jeff mentioned, we're going to be posting this session. It's been recorded and it'll go to YouTube and it'll be available, um, that we'll send out as a link and it'll be available on the uh, website, the um, Faculty of Science website. So any closing words? Thanks for coming everybody. Yeah, thank it was, you. this. the response was, Fantastic. Thank you very much. And great questions. Thank you. Happy holidays to everyone. Happy holidays.